This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Emergency orotracheal intubation is indicated in any situation in which definitive control of the airway is needed. Specific indications include cardiac or respiratory arrest, failure to protect the airway from aspiration, inadequate oxygenation or ventilation, and impending or existing airway obstruction. Orotracheal intubation is also commonly performed as part of the care of the critically ill patient with multi-system disease or injuries and to facilitate control of the airway during surgical procedures requiring general anesthesia. In emergence cases, such as cardiac arrest, airway management is of paramount importance and there are very few contraindications to orotracheal intubation. Unstable cervical spine injury is not a contraindication, but intubation must be performed with strict inline stabilization of the cervical spine. If neuromuscular blocking agents or sedatives are used to facilitate intubation, the difficulty of intubation must be assessed and planned for before proceeding. This assessment is discussed in more detail in the accompanying written supplement. The presence of tumors, trauma, burns, edema, or infection of the pharyngeal or laryngeal soft tissues may distort airway anatomy, leading to difficult orotracheal intubation. When faced with a potentially difficult airway, consulting with an experienced intubator and preparing to use an alternative intubation technique are recommended. Begin by gathering the required equipment. You will need gloves, a protective face shield, and a working suction system, a laryngoscope with appropriate blade, an endotracheal tube with stylet, and a 10 milliliter syringe. You will also need a bag valve mask attached to oxygen, an oral or nasal airway, and tape or an endotracheal tube holder. There are two main types of laryngoscope blades each available in various sizes. The tip of the Macintosh blade is curved. The Miller blade is straight and each requires a slightly different technique. The choice of blade is based largely upon the experience and personal preference of the operator. A size 3 or 4 Macintosh or a size 2 or 3 Miller can be used in most adult patients. Endotracheal tubes are sized according to the internal diameter of the tube. 70, 75, or 80 millimeter tubes are appropriate for most adults. The tubes have a balloon on the distal end that, when inflated, creates a seal between the tube and the tracheal lumen and prevents air leaks and aspiration of gastric contents. You will also need a stethoscope and an end tidal carbon dioxide detector to assess for proper placement of the endotracheal tube. Commonly used detectors change color in the presence of carbon dioxide. Before proceeding, be sure that all equipment is readily accessible and functioning. Inflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube to check for leaks. Insert the stylet into the endotracheal tube making sure that the tip of the stylet does not extend beyond the end of the endotracheal tube. Be sure that the suction catheter is secured within easy reach. Obtain intravenous access and place the patient on a monitor if time and conditions permit. Assign an assistant to watch the monitor during the procedure and report any changes. Adjust the height of the bed so that the patient's head is level with the lower portion of your sternum. Unless contraindicated, place the patient into the sniffing position by placing a pillow or folded towel under the patient's occiput. This combination of flexion of the neck and extension of the head improves the alignment of the axes of the oral cavity, pharynx, and larynx, facilitating optimal visualization of the vocal cords. If the clinical situation allows, Pre-oxygenate the patient with a non-rebreather mask or a bag valve mask with 100% oxygen, 
for at least three minutes prior to the intubation. The use of sedative and paralytic medications greatly enhances the success rate of endotracheal intubation. However, their use is beyond the scope of this video. Remove the patient's upper and lower dentures, if present, immediately prior to laryngoscopy. Keep the dentures close at hand so that they may be rapidly reinserted to improve the mask seal if bag mask ventilation is required. An assistant should apply the SELIC maneuver by applying firm pressure to the cricoid cartilage. The SELIC maneuver compresses the soft wall esophagus between the cricoid cartilage and the cervical vertebrae, theoretically preventing passive regurgitation of gastric contents. Position your body so that your eyes are at a distance from the patient that facilitates binocular vision. Hold the laryngoscope in your left hand blade down. Open the patient's mouth with your right hand. Insert the laryngoscope blade to the right of the patient's tongue. Gradually move the blade to the center of the mouth, pushing the tongue to the left. Visualize the epiglottis. Ideal placement of the laryngoscope blade depends on whether a curved or straight blade is used. Place the tip of the curved blade into the vollecula between the base of the tongue and the epiglottis and lift anteriorly to expose the vocal cords. When using a straight blade, place the tip of the blade just past the epiglottis and lift anteriorly to expose the vocal cords. When the tip of the blade is correctly positioned, lift the laryngoscope upwards and forwards at a 45 degree angle. Direct the force of your lift along the axis of the laryngoscope handle in the direction of the ceiling over the patient's feet. Avoid bending your wrist or rocking the blade against the patient's teeth, which can result in dental or soft tissue injury and will not enhance the view of the glottis. If available, an assistant should gently pull on the right side of the cheek to enhance visibility of the glottis. Hold the endotracheal tube in your right hand. While maintaining your view of the vocal cords, insert the endotracheal tube into the right side of the patient's mouth. The tube should not obstruct your view of the vocal cords during this critical part of the procedure. Pass the tube through the vocal cords until the balloon disappears into the trachea. Remove the stylet and advance the tube until the balloon is 3 to 4 centimeters beyond the vocal cords. Inflate the endotracheal balloon with air to the minimum pressure required to prevent air leaks during tidal volume ventilation with a bag. This usually requires less than 10 cc's of air. The assistant must maintain cricoid pressure until tube placement in the trachea is confirmed. The end of the endotracheal tube should lie in the mid-trachea 3 to 7 centimeters above the carina. A good rule of thumb is 22 centimeters at the teeth for the average size adult. Place the end tidal CO2 detector onto the endotracheal tube and attach the ventilation bag, administering a few tidal volume breaths. Carbon dioxide will be reliably and consistently detected within the first six breaths of an endotracheal intubation and with each exhalation thereafter, except in some cases of cardiac arrest when gas exchange may not occur. Assess secondarily for esophageal tube placement by auscultating over the stomach during positive pressure ventilation. Auscultate both lungs in the mid-axillary line to assess for equal bilateral air movement. If breath sounds are diminished on the left side after intubation, you may need to gradually withdraw the endotracheal tube until symmetrical breath sounds are auscultated. Chest radiography is used to assess the patient's pulmonary status after intubation and to ensure that the tip of the radio-opaque line embedded in the endotracheal tube is well positioned at the level of the mid-trachea and not in either mainstem bronchus. 
Note that radiography cannot be relied upon to detect esophageal intubation. Secure the endotracheal tube to the patient's head once proper position has been confirmed. If available, you should use an endotracheal tube holder to secure the tube as these devices aid in the prevention of accidental displacement. If such a device is not available, tape may be used instead. First, attach the tape to the patient's cheek and then wrap it circumferentially around the tube. Next, affix the free end of the tape to the patient's other cheek. Pharmacologic sedation and hand restraints may be employed to prevent inadvertent extubation. The most serious complication of endotracheal intubation is unrecognized esophageal intubation, which may lead to hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and death. Laryngoscopy can provoke vomiting and aspiration of gastric contents, causing pneumonitis or pneumonia. Additional complications include bradycardia, laryngospasm, bronchospasm, and apnea due to pharyngeal stimulation. Trauma to teeth, lips, vocal cords, and exacerbation of cervical spine injuries can also occur.